raised in church. How many of you were raised in church? I, I shared a few weeks ago the story of how my, my mom came to the Lord, and that was when I was about seven, eight years old, and it just radically changed the Randolph household. Uh, church then became something that we went to like every Sunday, we went on Wednesdays. It was just a part of the, the, the staple of our, of our family. It wasn't a negotiable, like, do we go? We just went. It's glad for it. And I grew up kind of, you know, I, I, I didn't have a problem with church. It was nice people. I liked the kids that I was with in the youth groups and stuff like that. And it was, it was good that, you know, the sermons were boring. But some things never change, right? So it was, it was good. But then I, I got squirrely and went off the deep end for a number of years. And when I came back home to Jesus, uh, I got involved in church again. In fact, went into the ministry. I was a youth pastor for a few years at, at different congregations. And then at 27, I took over my first role as a, as a senior pastor in Northern California. Me and I had a congregation of about 12 people. And you got to start somewhere. And it was great. And it was during that time, as I grew with this congregation, and we, we spent the next few years growing and, and getting to know each other, that I, I feel like I experienced church for the first time. You know, I'd been raised in it, and I'd even been in the ministry. But it wasn't until I, I was a part of that church as their pastor that I, I got it. And it was exactly what we've talked about these last few years. I realized at church, like we talked about week number one, it wasn't a building. It wasn't a, a place that we went. It was people. And then week number two, we talked about something I experienced with that first congregation is that it was a place for authentic connection, that we could authentically connect, authentically connect with one another and grow and go on this journey together. And then I experienced also what we talked about last week, which is that we can serve passionately and invest and see what God does as each one brings his own part. And I'm really excited about today. Today's one of my favorite topics and, uh, but before we get to it, let's look at the, the verse that we have. We've looked at this verse every Sunday for, uh, throughout this series, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. By the way, did you happen to bring your outdoor voice with you? No? Okay, there we go. Are we ready? This is like the voice you used last night when you watched the Warriors kick butt. Okay, that voice. Are we ready? I know I'm in L.A. I never get a big response for, for that. Hebrews 10, starting with verse 24. Here we go. Let us consider how to inspire each other to greater love and to righteous deeds, not forgetting to gather as a community, as some have forgotten, but encouraging each other, especially as the day of his return approaches. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to be in awe, what it means to be in awe. There are certain things that really bring that awe out of me, you know, that woe to my heart. Um, a couple of my favorite places. This one right here, this is Tahoe. I love Tahoe. We grew up going there. I, I took Mary Nell uh, there on our honeymoon because it's one of my favorite places in the world. And I love, whether it's summer or winter, I love being in Tahoe. It just is a ah. Say ah. Ah. Okay, next one. Another favorite place of mine. Who knows where that is? Yosemite. It is. It's Yosemite. I uh, stole that off of Sean Tucker's Facebook page yesterday afternoon because I know he and Katie and the kids were over there, and so I went to go look at the pictures because I love Yosemite. El Capitan, the, 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 the river, the Merced River, all of it. It's just gorgeous. And then this next one is like my favorite place on earth, and that's the Nepali coast. So that's right off Kauai, our home, and it's just, it's, it's breathtaking. It, how many of you have ever been there? Anybody ever been there? Is, am I wrong? I am right. You kayak in or go in or you can hike in, and it's just, it's incredible. But it, it, it doesn't compare to the next thing that took my breath away. That's right. She still takes my breath away every day. That was our wedding right there. It's so funny because I cut, you see the champagne glass? I'm next to her with a pair of dopey sunglasses on going... And I'm like, babe, why did you choose me? But I'm glad you did. And then one that I think we can all agree on, uh, this takes our breath away. <laughs> me lovers. I'm sure you've had things in your life that have uh, brought that awe. I mean, that awe. 
Maybe it was when you saw your spouse or your bride at that time come down the aisle and you went, wow. Or the eyes of your firstborn child opened for the first time and you're like, ah. Or maybe it was a loved one who has been deployed and they came back home and there was an awe moment. Whatever it was, maybe it was a time that you encountered God and it was, whoa, ah. I remember the first time that really happened with me. It was, it was, it was life changing. I had come to the Lord. I'd given my heart to the Lord and I'd been trying to walk with him for about a year and a half. I'd only been out of being incarcerated for about a, a year and a half and I was still struggling and I was, I was fervent. I really wanted to serve God. I really did. But I was, I was frustrated. I thought a lot of Christians, I felt like were hypocrites and I didn't like they were treating one another or what they were doing and I was disillusioned with that. More than that, I was horrified by the, by the stuff that was still existing in my heart and in my mind. And I was discouraged, to say the least. And this one day, I, I grabbed my Bible, and I went into a room, and I closed the door, and I wanted to pray because I needed to know him. And so I prayed, and I started out praying, uh, kind of typical, you know, Lord, you know, I just need you. Lord, would you show yourself? Or God, please help me. And I was just praying like that. And all of a sudden, I had this moment, and I realized this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to try to live for a God that I don't really know. And I said, I just, there's too much involved. And it hit me, and it scared me, because I knew I was serious. I can't do this if I don't really know him. And that, that scared me. So I, I got on my knees, and I began to really pour out my heart. I told God... Literally, I said, I am not leaving here until you show up. And he, he kind of put that to the test because I was in there like for hours. I'm like, okay, anytime now. But I was, and, and there was a certain point where I just began to pour it out. God, I need to know you. You know, he says he'll be found when we search for him with all of our heart. And I, I literally had that holy moment where it was like, God, I'm desperate for you. Please, Lord, show me, speak to me, do something with me. And I, I don't know how to describe it, and I'm not, I could not exaggerate this enough. I just felt he, just his presence filled that small room. It was so thick. I, I recoiled because I knew I was, it was like Isaiah. If you're ever familiar with the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, where he says, depart from me, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips. You're a holy God. I felt like that. I recoiled because I, all I was aware of was his supremacy, his vastness, his bigness. This was, I realized who it was that I was actually praying to. This was God. And man, I broke and I recoiled and I was afraid almost. And then he opened my heart and opened my mind and started to speak to my heart and saying, son, Mark, I love you. You are my boy. And all these things that I had about not liking certain things in my mind and my behaviors and stuff like that, he just began to hold it and, and just began to reveal his pleasure of me. And even when my mind wanted to argue and say, but God, look at you. No, just you, my son, and the acceptance and the pleasure and the joy of God. I got filled with so much joy in that room. I tell you, and again, no exaggeration. I left that room. Two things happened. One, I could not wipe the smile off my face for like four days. I'm walking around. To, I'm in the grocery store. <laughs> eggs, please, eggs. You know, I, I, everywhere. And, and the second thing that happened, I knew at that moment, I didn't know before that moment what I was going to do with my life, but I knew that moment I was going to spend somehow the rest of my life, I had to tell people, about this amazing Jesus. I had to and made a decision to go into ministry. This is the, the awe that I believe that God wants us all on different levels and different ways to experience with him. Write this down because this is, this, is, this is today's why church. This is why we do. And I love this one. To worship wholeheartedly. To worship wholeheartedly. That's a floodgate effect. A floodgate, as you know, it's just a large gate attached to a river or to a reservoir. 
that uh, either opens or stops the, 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 the flow of water or it keeps the water in. And we, it's real important. We want to wholeheartedly worship so that we can have this, this flood of God in our lives, right? And we think, well, how does that happen? And we tend to think that God's the one who has that lever and, and he does that and opens it up to our heart, you know? But really, I believe it's us that we're the ones who approach him and we're not just going to God with what we can get from him. Like, we love it when we feel his presence or we, we feel him say things to our hearts and we speak, but really isn't worship about us coming into his presence and opening up the floodgates of our hearts and pouring out on him the worship and the adoration and the reverence and the respect and the praise that he is so worthy of. That's really what it means to worship. It's not approaching him so much on what we get from him, although how many of you are glad? We get a lot from him when we do worship, right? I'm super happy about that. But the impetus of worship is on what we bring to him. It's so important. Write this down, number one. You were created to worship. If you're wondering why you were created, it's for many things. One of the scripture says that we were created for his pleasure. Same reason we have kids. But we were created also to worship. It's a Greek word, worship, proskuneo, which means, real simple, it means to pay homage and to give reverence, you know, to show affection for and to have a display of affection and reverence and homage and, and respect. And we're all created to give our worship to someone or something. Luke chapter 19, Jesus is in this scene here, and he reaches a... a, a the cities by the Mount of Olives. Well, let's just read it. He reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, and all of his followers began to shout out and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. They're all praising him, and some of the Pharisees, remember, they're the, the religious elite that had long ago lost connection with God and were just professional religious people. They, they, uh, they were among the crowd, and they said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And he replied, which I love it. He said, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Creation was fashioned to praise the Lord, to worship the Lord. And a lot of times what happens is that we'll come into a, a place like this on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, and the band's up here, and they're, they're doing their thing, and we're out there, and we tend to look at it like, here's the performers, and then we're the audience in the seats, right? I mean, if we're just being honest, it's kind of a lot of times how we look at it. Here's the performers, and we're the audience in the, in the seats. But really, we're all the band. We're all the performers. We're all those who are doing it, and we're doing it, and God is the audience, He's the one getting all the glory, and we're, they're helping us, and they do a great job at that week after week of leading us, but then we join together our voices and our songs and our hearts, and we come and we offer it up to the King of glory, and we give him the worship. And you may say, well, I don't like to sing that much. Don't raise your hand if that's you, but I, it's all right. There's, uh, you, and you know what? The person in front of you may be very happy that you don't like to sing loud. Who knows? But there's some people who go, I just, you know, that's not really my thing. I don't, ah, you know. I'm like, that's all right. Singing's not the only way we praise the Lord. There's, a, there's an author and a, a teacher who's impacted me over the years, Dr. Tony Evans. And he said this. I really like this. He said, if you limit worship to where you are, like at this place, the minute you leave that place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumpled up church bulletin. So worship isn't a, a place that we go in order to do. It's a way that we live. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat here. I'm going to go to the end of your outline. I want to give you the bottom line right now, and we're going to work down through that. Worship is not the song you sing. Worship is the life you live. It's the life we live. I mean, it includes the songs we sing. We worship him through the words of our mouth, right? 
and, and the, the declaration of his wonder and his beauty as we sing songs to him, that's wonderful. But it's, it's way more than that. Worship is the way that we live. I have a friend who's a pastor on the big island of Hawaii. And he wasn't always a pastor. He was a businessman, a very successful businessman. He owned a uh, restaurant right on, if you're familiar with that island at all, there's a, a Lee Drive where they do the, the Iron Man competition and it's got all the shops and the restaurants, a real touristy area. And he owns a big restaurant right there, just prime location, successful restaurant. He comes to know the Lord. Uh, it was through, actually, his wife passed away very early with his sickness. And what could have been something that just devastated and broke him, and certainly it did devastate him, but God redeemed it and brought him to himself and gave Damien a whole new look on life. And today he's happily married and serving God. Back then when he came to the Lord, I mean, it was radical. He was changed. He, he felt at home for the first time. And almost immediately all he wanted to do was figure out what can I do for God? And so he was constantly active in the community and trying to do something. And then one day it hit him, my gosh, I own a restaurant in one of the most touristy areas of the nation. And he goes, I'm going to shut down my restaurant on Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons, and we're going to have church service right here. And so he did it. He shut down and it stopped business for, you know, those seven hours and invited all the tourists in. And what happened is that not only tourists came in, but a lot of local people from the community and a lot of broken people, a lot of homeless people started coming into his services. And he was rocking it. A mutual friend introduced us. This is how I, I got to know Damien. And he'd fly me over about once a month. I'd come over and, and share, but then meet with his leaders and go over things. And I'm watching this, this, tra this crazy thing happen right here in Kailua, Kona, that's reaching all these people. Uh, he, would, he, would, he would feed them after the services, which may have been why a lot of people decided to show up because it was good restaurant food after each service. But nonetheless, he'd feed them after the services and touching lives um, but one, one Sunday, he, he and I were kind of off to the side while the service was going on and the band was playing and people were worshiping and he, and he said what he thought was a confession, really. He's going, you know what? Man, I just, I just don't know really how to worship like that. He goes, I'm jealous of it. They're, 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 he goes, I watch him Sunday after Sunday and they're emotional. And he goes, I just don't, I don't, I, it's just not me. Like he wasn't wired that way. You know, to feel emotional or to do this stuff. And, and he was saying, but I want to worship. And I go, Damien, bro, look around here. Look what you've done here. Bro, if that's not worship, I don't know what worship is. It's the way that he invested his life. It's the way that he lived on mission. It's the way that he looked at what God had given him and said, what can I do to honor you with what you have given me? It's way more than a song that we sing, all as wonderful as that is. It's the way that we live saying, what can I do to bring you honor? Why? Because I have great awe of who you are. And that's the way Damien worshiped. That's what God is calling us to do as well. But understand this, number two, super important. There is a war for your worship. We're created to worship. But there's a war, a battle for where we give our worship. The enemy of our souls does not want us to give our worship to the one who it's due. Here's a uh, look at a section of the Ten Commandments. I'm sure you've all heard of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, just a small portion of it. God is telling his people, he says, you must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of any kind of the heavens, or on the earth, or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. The reason God is so adamant about this and uses such strong language is because he knows there are no other gods. I am a God. And here's the thing. In the scriptures, there's a real difference between jealous and envy. You see, God wasn't envious of something that didn't belong to him. He wasn't craving something that didn't. He was jealous for something that did belong to him as the creator. And it's the same way that we can be jealous. I, I'm jealous for my wife's love, if you understand that, because it belongs to me. Kids have a right to be like jealous for their, their parents' affection and care and love. My children, 
I'm, I'm jealous for them to succeed in life and to know him so well. I'm jealous for that for them. God is jealous over you for you to know him and for you to receive from him the things that he wants to impart in your life. And so here's, here's why it's so important. Back in time, they, they had, you know, like idols, uh, wooden idols, gold idols that they made and they put in certain spots and they would give these idols their reverence, false gods their reverence. And it burned within God Almighty, the one true God, because he knew he wanted to have them. He wanted their worship and he wanted to bless them in a way that only he could. Well, today, you know, we don't have a lot of folks shooting down to Home Depot to buy some lumber and carving out, you know, fishes and stuff, you know, and moons, sun gods and stuff like that. Our idols have evolved. Our false gods have evolved. We have false gods like money. Not a bad thing. How many of you like it? The rest of you are liars. <laughs> money. That we want more and more of it. Pleasure. Pleasure. People make pleasure, pleasure seeking, extreme hedonism, pleasure a false god really in their lives or worship. They give themselves to it. Or fame. And you may think, well, I'm off the hook with that one because I don't really, you know, have any illusions of being famous. I don't care about being famous. Well, more on a micro scale. Like, I just want more likes. Because fame really is what? It's just, it's pay attention to me. It's look at me. It's self-worship. And so I want to see how many more followers I could get. Or really, will somebody just, you know, look at me? And, and there's nothing, don't, don't hear me wrong, there's nothing with, wrong with, with social media. It's so we want to make sure where our heart is after, what it is that we're giving ourselves to. My goodness, this last week, so funny. I don't know if funny or not, but anyways, I'm, I, I run across this thing on a YouTube where uh, celebrities are surprising some of their, like, super fans, right? I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that, but it was, it was, it was, it, I want to say cute, but a little more disturbing, because they, they show up and they surprise them and then the fan turns around and sees them and they're like, a lot of these fans are just like, ah, 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 and they, they're like fluids running out of their bodies and just in contortions and just, ah, you know, because so much was given to this thing. And I'm like, oh, and I get it, especially because we live in LA. And so, you know, Liking to see somebody or something like that or, or appreciating their works or whatever. This is good, but we don't want to get carried away. Uh, and we all can do this to a little bit. I, the other day, I, just like two weeks ago, I'm sitting down at uh, Pinmar Park right over here. Me and Mary Nell took baby Grace and we're doing it and she's playing and stuff. And I, I was getting tired, so I sat down on a chair by this little opening in a gate that led from the play area park to the ballparks. And I'm just sitting there and I'm watching Grace. And I see, I see this dude walking towards me. And he's got a ball cap on, and he's walking pretty fast, though. It's like he's just focused, you know? And I look at him, and I go, that looks like Owen Wilson, who I really like Owen Wilson's movies, right? He's funny. And we just watched one like a week earlier. And I go, that looks like Owen, but I wasn't sure until he got closer and closer and closer, and then it was proof because I saw the nose, right? I saw the nose, and I went, and he, and he was like, he was walking right there in front. I went, dude. No, I didn't actually do that. I did it in my brain, though. I yelled it really loud. I just didn't have the courage to get it out. But I was like, and so I get it. I really, it was like, whoa. In fact, I went and told my wife. I said, because she hasn't seen any kind of celebrity and she wants to see a celebrity. And I said, babe, Owen Wilson just passed me. He's just right there. Just that guy, right? That's him. We just watched him on a movie. And so she took off like for 15 minutes and stalked him. <laughs> she, she wanted to get behind him and hear his voice just to make sure it wasn't a poser. And I get it. And that's fun, you know. But when we give our worship, our worship, we want to make sure it's attached to God and God alone. Because one, he's the only that is worthy of it. And he's stable. He doesn't change the way he feels about you from one day to another. I don't want to give my worship to a person. Here's, here's what we need to understand. Who or what we give our worship to 
We look to them or it for our validation, for our sense of self-worth. I have given them the power now to validate me. I don't want to give that to anyone or anything other than an immutable God who does not change, who doesn't wake up with different moods, who no matter, you know, if I've done good or I, there's no disappointing him because he lives in eternity. He's not affected by a recession or my career or anything else like that. He is the one who was worthy of worship and he is the one who is safe to give our worship to. He is God. I want to worship him wholeheartedly. Number three, the last one for today. Worship is in response or is a response to who God is and what he has done. When I think about who God is, it's real simple. I, just, I want to think, I think about creation. Again, places like Tahoe or the Pauly Coast. And I think about creation and go, whoa. Or his, his greatest creation, which is human beings and how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. When I think about who God is, I look at creation. When I think about what he has done, I look at the cross. I look at the cross. See, here's something about value. One of the ways that you know how much someone values you is by what they are willing to go through in order to get to you and to be with you. What they're willing to go through in order to be with you. And I look at what Jesus was willing to go through in order to be with me. That's something we value. I had a, uh, a problem. This was a, about 10 years ago or so. A little more than that. Anyways, I had, my, I had, I, I, I don't even want to, I'm embarrassed to say, but I, my ego was very attached to a book collection that I had. I began reading books at a, uh, when I first started out in the ministry, and it started out real sincerely. I just wanted to, I wanted to get information. I wanted to read. I wanted to learn. And so I, I was buying books all the time. I always had books with me. I was always reading, but they grew and they grew. And I had well over a thousand books that were probably more like about 1,500, no exaggeration. And they just filled in my office and so they filled the shelves and double stacked and all these shelves going down. And what it became was something of my ego. I thought I looked very impressive. I must be educated. Look behind me. <laughs> and I, in fact, it got so bad, I would order these sets of books by impressive authors and they looked really good and put them in the shelves and had no idea what was inside of them. I didn't read them, but they looked good. Take a picture. <laughs> it was so silly that, has God ever just busted you? Like I felt the Lord say to me, dude, does God call anybody else dude in here? Dude, what are you doing? And I just knew. I mean, busted. I, I'm just, it's vanity. It's stupid. It's silly. What am I doing? And I was convicted by it. I thought, how oh, silly. So I, I got rid of a lot of them, all but about 50 books that I saved that were my favorites, right, that I still had on my shelf. But the rest we put in a big room in our church and called other churches friends that I had that were pastors of other churches and some other friends and stuff like that. I said, hey, just come down, first come, first serve. Any books you want, just come and take them. And so they did. And they came upon them and took them. And then about six months later, I was looking for one of my most favorite books by R.T. Kendall, God Meant It for Good. Uh, incredible account of the story of Joseph. Helped me so much. At a time in my life, ministered to me. It was like a companion. The book was in my back pocket. I wrote all over it and everything. And I couldn't find it. It wasn't in that section of books that I, that I kept. And so I, nah, and I, I turned my office upside down. I went home. I went home early. I didn't even wait to get off work. I went home, turned my, my bedroom where I had some other office materials upside down looking for it. I couldn't find it. Now I realized, and you might be thinking, well, you know, you, you, you could actually buy another one. They probably wasn't the last one that they had. But it was, it was that particular book that was my friend, that it was a companion and so, again, I went through everywhere in the church. I couldn't find it. I had our secretary, Stacy, call these people. I said, make a list of everybody that came because she was kind of responsible for letting people in. So the churches and the people, and then we called them. I wanted my book. <laughs> and so I called them up like, hey, you know, can you check? No, Mark, I don't have that one. Okay, yeah, 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 okay. Can you check again? 
you know? In fact, true, after calling like these 20 different people or churches and stuff like that, about seven of them I totally didn't trust that they looked hard enough, so I showed up at their door. <laughs> I didn't, didn't, none of them, none of them had it. But that's the value I placed on it. Funny, uh, it was about another six months later that I was going through my file cabinet looking for something, and there was a file that had like a special asterisk on it, and I remember then I put the book in there so I wouldn't lose it. <laughs> Does anybody else have problems like that? Yeah? Ah, oh, gee. Well, that's, that's, I did that for a book because it had value to me, what I was willing to go through to try to recover it. Man, man, when I think about what not only Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago, but what he's done in my life and in some people that I know and just the depths he went to to find me, to find you, to stay with us when I'm running away and he's chasing me down. When I've been in situations, even since as a Christian, where it's like, oh man, I'd be so ashamed for anybody to know I've done this or know I've done that. And, and yet God knows and he's still pursuing me. The depth of his love. The abandonment he has of pursuing us. When that hits, the value he places on you and I. The, the value. You can't stop but go and be in awe. Oh God, you're good. It's like when we were singing that this morning. You are good. You are good. Engage in that because he is. That's what it means to worship. And we do that not only with our songs, we do that with our entire lives. Um, I want to invite the band back up. We're going to have a song of worship at the end today. But as they're coming up, would you look at the scripture with me? It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. The author here says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. Aren't you glad about that with God, that he's unshakable? A lot of stuff we anchor to are shakable. But he is unshakable. And since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Worshiping God with holy fear and awe. What does that holy fear mean? Another word you could use here, with great respect. With great respect, and you are God, and worshiping him wholeheartedly with awe and with respect. Here's the bottom line again. Worship is not the song you sing, it's the life you live. We worship God not only through what, what we sing and say, but how we live our lives. Listen, to be honest, when I live with his glory in mind, I'm a much better husband. Because I want to be a husband to the glory of God. I fail in that so often, but that's what I want. It's the same way with parenting. When we're parenting, and we understand that we're parenting in a way that's worship to God because we're putting him first, we parent better. When we live our lives in our workplace, in our classrooms, wherever we're at, before an audience of one, that, Lord, how I work today, how I treat people today, God, let it reflect. I want to do it. As, uh, it's worship to you. He takes that. It's like me telling my friend Damien, look around. Your life is worship to God. Man, how fulfilling that is. And to, to live that out is exactly how, and we're going to do that. We're going to do that in less than perfect ways. We're all going to. But we get up the next morning and we shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace and we say, for you, let's go, Lord. And it changes everything. So I want to take a moment right now and let's, let's engage with the Lord. Wherever you're at today, I want to invite you. Would you stand with me? And let's worship the Lord with a closing song and just let our minds just take in what he has done for us and how worthy he is that our lives be offered as worship to him. Father, we love you today. We're grateful. Thank you. Thank you for placing such a value on us, your patience with us, your love towards us your pursuit of us. God, right now we say, you alone are worthy of worship. If you feel comfortable doing that, say that to him right now. God, you alone are worthy of worship. You alone are worthy of worship. And we give it to you today, Lord. The songs that we sing, but with the life that we live. In Jesus' name.